see you all this morning. You know, when I left the house, it wasn't raining. And, um, I don't know, two minutes after I left, started just started pouring. And I was thinking of those, uh, I live, I live uh, near Sukkot Road, and uh, there are two cemeteries along Sukkot Road nearby. And I thought, oh, people are camped there. Uh, and, you know, admirable how they brave the rain and still stay there. But what, what do people go to cemeteries for at this time, on this day? See, according to what we prayed for earlier, or we prayed earlier in the collect, we ask God to grant us grace that we would be followers of the examples of the saints, particularly in their virtuous and godly living. Many times we remember a saint for their martyrdom, how they died, how they you know, uh, withstood persecution. And we particularly remember uh, how they died, or the, the, the gruesome way that they died, standing up for the gospel. We really are to, to uh, remember their godly living, not their dying, but their living. In what is called the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus started with uh, the Beatitudes. And he defines for us what Beatitudes mean, or the, the word Beatitude means. It means blessed. Blessed. My Bible, it, the margin says in the note, blessed means fortunate and prosperous. Fortunate and prosperous. Jesus defined it that way, it must be true. Uh, society has its own definition of, of the word blessed. We think we're blessed when we have, uh, we, we land a good job or we close a good uh, business transaction or somebody gives us, you know, something valuable. That, in the world's eyes is a blessing. It's also said that the church has redefined blessing by adopting the, the world's definition of it. So that people come to church to be blessed. What does that mean? To be materially prosperous. Not to be prosperous in the sense of what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, blessed are you when men revile you. When Christians are reviled and we counsel them, what do we tell them? Oh, well, well, that's, so that's so good. This will pass. We don't say, man, you're blessed. Right? We say, oh, you're persecuted. God will avenge you. Right? From your enemies. Well, are they enemies or are they blessed? Through whom God's, God's blessings come to us. But we are blessed, particularly when we follow God's commands. When we seek after His righteousness and His heart. Things may happen. People may agree with us. People may disagree with us strongly to the point of, of persecuting us. But our blessing does not depend on that. Our blessing depends on the fact that we seek God's will and we walk in His likeness. Again, to the point of being revived, even to the point of dying. As the saints of all, although, have been demonstrated with their, with their lives and in their death. And thanks to their witness, we have an inspiration. We have a cloud of witnesses cheering us on and encouraging us and telling us it's way worth following God even if you die for it because blessed are you when you do so. Testimony of God's grace at work in man who will just give himself to him. 
Let your light shine before men, Jesus said, as a witness. We are to demonstrate God's grace, God's likeness in us. Demonstrate that before men. Let our light shine before men. I'd like us to note that first, first step is demonstrating. Peter and Paul, I mean, Peter and John, and they were at the temple in Acts chapter 4, and heavenly blessings for them. Um, they were at the temple, and they saw this beggar, a lame man, and Peter, Peter told him, look at us. Look at us. Look how God blessed us. We who would follow Him. We who would, who would obey Him. Look at us. We may not have what the world call, calls blessings. We don't have silver and gold. But what we do have, which God has blessed us with, we give to you so that you also would be blessed. And the lame man, you know the story, the lame man accepted that blessing and he found life. And he followed after the example of the disciple. Demonstrate. Let your light shine. But it doesn't end there. You know, um, and this is a, a, a preview of what of what we will uh, have for our direction for the next 12 months, for the next year. And what we will uh, jumpstart at the, the Discipleship Summit is we will focus on discipleship and evangelism. Evangelism starts with discipleship. How do you disciple? Well, I look as one of the patterns. Uh, Luke chapter 10, when, when Jesus sent his disciples two by two, seven of them, two by two, and then one of his instructions was do not go from house to house. Somebody wel welcomes you, stay in that house. Stay. Dwell with them. Dwell with them and be committed to giving them the good news. But dwell with them. It's such a confrontation because if you dwell with somebody, they will not just hear your good news, what you say. They will also see how you conduct yourself. They will see whether you walk your talk. And it's, it's going to be a confrontation. In fact, also, one of our focuses for the next year is family with whom we dwell, with whom we live, who sees our strengths but also our weakness. That's discipleship. You don't hide anything, but that also keeps you on your toes so that you, it behooves you to, to walk your walk and to also follow what you say. No, you cannot say, nobody has a right to say to their children or to anyone, do as I say and ignore what I do. Right? Nobody. Stay in that house. Do not keep moving from house to house. Remember Jesus and the Samaritan woman? She, he told her the good news of the gospel. And she turned out to be uh, an evangelist to her village. But what happened next? Jesus stayed with the villagers for two days. After two days, they told her, you know, we believe now not because of what you just proclaimed to us, but because we have tasted and seen and experienced for ourselves what you were talking about. Is Jesus dwelt with us for two days and we saw what we heard from you. Because people don't just need uh, something, a statement from us that is said. What they need is a revelation as a result of a personal encounter, an experience. 
Psalm said today, taste and see the goodness of the Lord. Not just hear of it. Taste it for yourself and, and see for yourself. Actually, what we call our Bible, the New Testament particularly, and the Old Testament, they're a result not of a boss dictating to a secretary what to write, you know, and putting them under a, a spell first or in a trance uh, by the Holy Spirit. No, it's not like that. These authors tasted and saw the goodness of the Lord. And what they, what they experienced, they put in writing so that long after they died, next generations would at least read of their experience. But this is not just a book of facts or information. It's a book of revelation, of what we call the brain of power, uh, the Word of God in, in power. There are people that tasted it and, and seen and experienced. First John chapter 1 has the author John saying, what we have touched, what we have seen, what we have heard, what we have experienced, who we have walked with, what we have personally uh, dwelt with, this is what we proclaim to you. Not something we learned from Bible school or seminary. Not just something somebody told us is really, really important. No, what we have tasted and seen, this we proclaim to you, so that our fellowship with Him would be also your fellowship. A revelation. You know, likewise our mission of evangelism is not like, you know, we come up with a spiel and we read it to somebody who has trained it, who hasn't heard it. And we tell them this is important. Pay attention. Because if we do that, it would be just like product endorser, right? Or, you know, we're not just to be, uh, we're not just to give a report like a student wanting a high grade, right? We have to do this because we need to earn points in heaven. No. It needs to be alive in it. Or we're not supposed to just be like, you know, relaying, uh, relaying the news like a journalist. No, people don't need infomercials or book reports or the evening news. What they need is something that we have tasted and seen and experienced. Because that would be alive to them, especially when we dwell with them and when they see that that is alive in us as well. You know, Sunday, Sunday, uh, for this gospel, it was about Zacchaeus finding life. Jesus staying with him in his house and Zacchaeus finding salvation that resulted from that encounter with Jesus. You see, it takes incarnation. I'll explain that way. Incarnation to get to the Zacchaeus of the world. What do I mean? Incarnation, not just demonstrating, not just identify, but not just dwelling with somebody, but identifying with them. Identifying with them. Not just reading a speech to them, or a book to them, or gathering facts for them, but to enter into their story. To identify with them, to get in their, into their shoes. To, to experience their plight, to go through their own experience. This is what Jesus did in the Incarnation. He didn't just come and dwell with us. He put on flesh so that he was tempted as we, we are. So that he goes through the problems we go through, the challenges we face, he also faced. He entered into our experience. He goes through our plight. He's not just like, you know, an insurance agent pretending to, 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 to you know, be concerned for you. But you only see him once a year when it comes time to collect their 
the year VP, right? Or, you know, one of the most difficult jobs, I, I would say, is, uh, is a staff at a memorial park. Because they would like uh, coordinate burials, and they would like pretend to be to be in grief with you. Even if they don't know you. I mean that's that's a difficult job for me because that that would that would entail a mastery of hypocrisy, right? Because you're concerned you have to be, you know, really experiencing what people experience. In in the Philippines, when somebody dies what do people say to the family? Tagalog. Nakikiramay. What do we mean by that? Nakikiramay. We, we, we grieve with them, right? Do we really grieve with them? Do we really feel what they feel? Probably we know the person who died probably to a certain extent, right? But Jesus to the full extent of our grief, of our plight, of our experience, he could identify with us. Pag sinabi niyang nakikiramay, talagang nakikiramay. He knew, he knows what we go through. As I said, he was tempted as we are, he experienced what we experienced, yet, yet he can tell us, by God's grace, we can overcome. By God's grace, we can live a saintly life. More than empathy, it's incarnation, it's putting on the flesh, it's, it's, it's taking on our life. The very opposite, the very opposite of condemning, like tax the Pharisee did, the tax collector, of separating, of elitism, of thinking we're better than others. No, we think we're better than others, and we think they need help, we go down to where they are, reach out to them, experience their plight, and show them how faith in God and God's grace can take them out of wherever they are and be lifted up with them and ascend with them. Far above all of the, that they are challenged with. We're blessed if we do this. Thank God for, for the lives of the saints who uh, came before us to give us witness, to give us testimony. You know, maybe the next time you go to the cemetery, don't just remember how you loved them there, but recall their life, their virtues, and how we can be inspired by their virtues living so that we can also apply that in our living. Because that's that's the whole point of All Saints Day. Not just remember our dead because you know we love them so much, but because we remember the good deeds that they have done and the example that they left for us. If we follow after that example, we would belong to a company of saints that have washed their robes clean and white in the blood of the Lamb. We can join them in enjoying the blessing of giving glory and praise to our God with the saints who understand the way it is, the kingdom of our God. Let us all stand.